Good evening. Happy Easter. Easter Sunday. Um, nothing too formal for this one. I've got a few things I want to whip through. I've got quite a lot of your comments on the update video that I put out yesterday. So I've sort of subheaded this one, an update on an update. And then I've got some letters that have been written to me. So your comments and some new stuff. We're going to be going into the Airbnb thing, climate lockdowns, apostrophes, why EVs are killing cats, uh, my shorts, the moon, coal, two pages on coal, exciting video for a Sunday, two pages about coal, volcanoes, a rebadge, Volvos, and then some letters that have been sent to me. So let's dive right into it, and I'm going to pretend I haven't tried to film this video four times and cocked up the intro every time. So let's not have an intro, let's just go. Right, the Airbnb thing, you'll remember about the Airbnb changing their policies for emergencies and this sort of stuff. Now, the dates for Airbnb changing their policies coincide with the signing of the World Health Organization's pandemic. Oh, there's a spelling mistake there. Pandemic treaty. It says plandemic. Sorry, that's autocorrected. Um, the, the dates for them changing their policy coincide with the signing of the World Health Organization's pandemic treaty. That is basically ceding our sovereignty and our ability to make our own decisions based on how we act if there is a pandemic and giving it to an unelected body. That's going to be signed around about that time. I think we've got nine weeks before that is signed. Um, that's pretty much the end of the world, basically. If that if that gets signed, then we lose all of our power to say no to everything. But there's plenty of other channels that are covering that. Someone else says, I saw this this morning and I interpret it as related to civil unrest in connection to the US election. Could also be to do with the US election. Deborah says, six month of the, the 6th of June, so the 6th of the 6th, in 2024, two plus four equals six. There's a lot of sixes there, uh, six, six, six. Not that we live in a satanic hole or anything like that. Thank you, Deborah. I mean, they do like to do, to use numbers, satanic numbers and all that sort of stuff. And someone else says the sixth day of the sixth month, two plus four equals six, 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 six. They use numbers. So the 6th of June, something's happening, but we're not quite sure what. Uh, someone else just quite simply says that sounds like climate lockdown being confirmed. <laughs> Right. Then Yvonne Davies says, I know what's coming. This news from Airbnb is the final confirmation I've been waiting to hear, to which many people said, pray tell. Uh, she says it's the grand solar minimum, the mini ice age from June through to the autumn equinox. The movement of the four gas giants planets will affect magnetic fields and our weather as they move closer to the Earth. Geoengineering aims to hide what is to come to avoid mass panic. Prepping for power outages and crop failures is essential. Uh, excellent. So, well, Yvonne also then goes on to say, Hi, Jeff. I love the news about vehicles. I used to be a Volvo fan until I discovered VW reliability. Looks like my reply about the severe weather disruption that is coming has been removed. I must have been too close to the truth. Looks like email it will have to be so you folks can be ready. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. Do email me some more information. What should we be doing? What should we be prepping? Uh, power outages and crop failures. So I guess you're going to be needing a generator, a lot of candles and some food. Uh, take all of that to your Airbnb and then you'll be covered if it does happen. Right. Someone else simply says climate lockdowns. Never heard of them. Now, interestingly, I first used the word climate lockdown in a blog that I must have written 15 years ago when I said that all this stuff was going to come to fruition. Um, it was a Google-based blog, and oddly enough, it's been removed, and I can't find it. So I can't read it to you because it's disappeared or it's been deleted. Um, so that's what climate lockdowns are all about. Right, that's a lot of the heavy stuff out of the way. Let's talk about apostrophes. Quite a few people have taken issue by where the apostrophe was on the video title. It was general updates something something. And Mike and a number of others said, Jeff, apostrophe in updates. Come on, that's not the first time either. Next, you'll be saying VIN number. <laughs> Vehicle identification number number. Um, oh wait, you have done in the past. VIN number, I do say VIN number because it's easy for the people to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, I've said this before. 
And yeah, Mike, you have said that before, but I have also replied to you before. General Update is a person and he owns the update. So it's General Update's update, which is why there's an apostrophe in there. It implies possession, uh, as this video will be General Update's update update, because this is an update on the update that General Update did yesterday. So consider yourselves updated. Right. EVs are killing cats. Uh, one point people are not talking about with EVs is the risk to animals. A friend of ours recently was distraught because she got in her EV with her family and reversed over the family cat. It's not funny, Jeff. Don't laugh. That's actually really sad. Breathe. It's just the way that that's been written. Uh, <laughs> she got in her EV with her family and reversed over the family cat which would no doubt have moved if it had been an internal combustion engine car. Thanks for your content. That's a really great point. Um, I think EVs should have, you know, those things that lorries have. This vehicle is reversing. This vehicle is maneuvering. They should have those for slow speeds because it could have been the family grandma, not the family cat. And that would be bad. Right. Another subheading, the shorts. Comment here. I love your shorts. Thank you. I like my shorts too. They are not, as some people have said, a tablecloth or some sort of weird Scottish kilt. They are my favourite shorts from joebrowns.co.uk. Someone here says, have you got a tablecloth covering your legs or do now need to wear, I do now need to wear sunglasses to watch your videos. By the way, I saw a man driving a Volvo the other day wearing exactly what you have around your legs. Uh, was it me? Someone else just says, is that some weird tartan kilt that you are wearing? No, it's just my favourite pair of shorts. But sadly, today it's not warm enough for my favourite shorts because weather. Right. New subheading, the moon. I've actually written the moan, uh, but the moon. Jeff, <laughs> a lot of people commented on the fact that this car has been to the moon, uh, whether or not man went to the moon, what's on the moon, how far away the moon is. There were a lot of comments about that. And I'm not digging into all of them, but I like this one. Jeff, the moon is local. It's in Earth's upper atmosphere. There was even an announcement made, but then it got binned. So about 100 to 180 miles away. You do know they've lied to us about everything. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, I do know that they've lied to us about everything. And as such, I'm not going to rule anything out because I've seen all the NASA videos and it's like, here we are on the space station filming from the space station broadcasting live. And it's like, why, why did a rat just walk around that thing? Because surely there shouldn't be any rats in space. And there was another one where the NASA astronauts were supposedly floating um, in space and they were doing a Q&A. There was an interview session with people and someone asked one of the astronauts where he grew up. Bearing in mind the astronaut at this point is up in space and he accidentally said, well, not far from here, actually. <laughs> and the other guys looked at him and were like, oh no, we've been rumbled. So I don't know. I'm not going to go into that one. Um, but yeah, so maybe the moon only is 100 to 180 miles away, in which case this car's been there a number of times. Right, coal. Onto the coal section, into the meat of the video, the dark part of the video. See what I did there, coal. Um, number of comments here, some of them are really good. Australian coal is brown coal, as is most German coal. Welsh coal is mainly anthracite or black coal. Anthracite is more energy dense than brown coal and is also considered to be less polluting. Great comment. Another comment, Australia is a major coal producer. Wales has 300 years of quality coal. We should be using this. Wales does indeed have 300 years of quality coal locked away in the coal mines. However, we now need to look at this comment. Producing anthracite coal. Producing? <laughs> Sound like that guy from Night at the Museum too. Producing anthracite in Welsh deep coal mines killed thousands of workers due to the sharp and fine dust that was inhaled, causing many debilitating and lethal lung diseases. Best to have a shortage of anthracite than risk killing more workers unnecessarily. And that's a good and valid comment. Now, we're going to get into a couple of longer comments because these are really good. This is Ben, and Ben says, I'm a volunteer at the Seven Valley Railway, and the suppliers who sourced the coal for us were using the last remaining coal mine in Wales, but due to the net zero nutters, they are now closing it down. During the experimental shutdown period, the suppliers had to source coal from Russia. Then, when conflict occurred, the suppliers had to switch to coal from Kazakhstan and now Australia, as you mentioned. This coal burns worse than the Welsh coal, 
and is more expensive to purchase, which we have to pass the cost to the people visiting through ticket prices. The daily train services now have one steam hauled service and two diesel hauled services. I didn't realise it's because they can't get the coal. Other preserved railways that run standard gauge are also having similar issues, but they vary on the length of the railway and the amount of carriages. The smaller narrow gauge railways, however, seem to be OK, and they can, if they want, use the bio coal, which is a mixture of waste, waste rice husks, molasses and coal dust moulded into a coal shape, which is cleaner burning but expensive to buy and comes in smaller quantities. I did not know any of that. Uh, bio coal, so bio coal is a mixture of waste rice husks, molasses and coal dust moulded into a piece of coal. It does seem to me that the net zero twerps and the government seem to be doing this purposely to many of the heritage museums that tell the story of Britain's industrial past to erase it from history so they can insert their altered history. What a great conclusion to that comment, Ben. Let's look at that again. It's being done deliberately to erase Britain's industrial past from history. Doesn't that sound about right with all the net zero stuff and all this electrify this stuff? We are deleting history by not talking about it. That's what seems to be going on. Great comment. Thanks for that, Ben. Another comment here. We here in Australia are selling coal to China so they can have cheap electricity. We are giving China the ability to make weapons and giving them the ability to take over the world. Another great comment in this cyclical thing, isn't it? This absolute farce of what we've got going on in the world with, as I said in that video, you've got a newspaper saying, oh, China's the enemy. And then the same will be going on in Australia. And then they're selling China the coal to power their economy that they then use to sell us the crap that we don't want. It's insane. Uh, one last one on coal. Great comment here. Coal is a gift from God for our benefit. Never forget, CO2 is plant food. So we'll leave that one there. Uh, but no, we won't. There is one more here. And this is from Steve. This is uh, someone else who's also in the know about coal. The coal comments were great. Everybody got really annoyed about the coal thing. And rightly so. Anyway, over to Steve. We used to buy coal from Australia and Brazil for our coke ovens and after carbonisation sent to our blast furnace for the burden. All coal is not the same. For instance, metallurgical coal needs to have good permeability and mechanical strength to allow blast air through it and to hold up a blast furnace burden. Other uses of coal demand the most suitable coal for that particular purpose. Low sulphur or low ash, low volatiles, etc, etc. The main reason for using Australian coal, though, is cost. Australian coal does not come from deep mined pits like UK coal, which is much more expensive to extract. Also, the human element in, in extracting coal is expensive. Meanwhile, in Australia, the coal is there open cast coal. The coal there is open cast coal. The deposits lying just a few feet from the surface and extracted by massive bucket machines to automatic conveyor belts and then carried in massive trucks called U-slids and then shipped in the biggest ships you have ever seen. All the gigantic, all this gigantic operation makes coal per ton cheaper than UK coal, even after shipping it halfway around the world. It's that simple. The likes of Scargill made UK coal even less attractive, with all the strikes increasing the price of UK coal even further. Now, in the UK, coal is classed as a very dirty fuel, and the government move away from it. The government's move away from it is relentless. Even steelworks in the UK are moving to remelting scrap steel instead of making virgin iron and steel. This is until the day when the price of scrap steel goes through the roof. All this is happening in the UK, while China trumps every environmental effort we have ever made by burning coal like it's going out of fashion. A strange world, but our conscience in the UK is clear. Another excellent comment. Thank you very much for that. And speaking of our conscience environmentally being clear, let's move to our next subheading, volcanoes. Someone quite simply says, don't mention the volcanoes. Interested to see if this comment is deleted. Well, the comment didn't get deleted and you did mention volcanoes. So let's just take a minute just to think about what volcanoes do as a plane goes over. Um, well, volcanoes, they chuck a whole load of ash and all sorts out the top, uh, but you've got to pay £12.50 to drive your Volvo into London. Anyway, talking of Volvos, this subheading is called Rebadge. 
Interesting factoid, we're skipping around the subjects again here, but uh, that video was quite popular, so apparently you don't mind when I just give you lots of little subheadings on lots of different subjects, and I quite enjoy making these videos as well, even with a hangover. Uh, barbecue yesterday, many chicken wings, and a lot of whiskey was consumed, and at one point I tried to buy a speedboat on eBay up until the point my wife stopped me. Uh, I genuinely think I probably would have bought a speedboat on eBay last night. She was like, why do you need a speedboat? I'm like, I, I can't think of a single reason reason why I don't need a speedboat. Uh, maybe who was that person in the comments early on there? Yvonne, could you let me know if during the Grand Solar Minimum I'm going to be needing a speedboat? Uh, and can you write that down and sign it so I can show my wife? Anyway, back to it. Interesting factoid, Volvo has dropped the recharge nomenclature to make it easier for customers to understand that these are EVs. Clearly, it's nothing to do with the negative association of plugging them in to uh, recharge them. They've also repurposed the T6 badge now for their EVs. I'm in a T5, which I think was previously on an internal combustion engine car. Funny old world, isn't it? So this is the Volvo C40 and C30. I think I drove, I, I drove either a C30 recharge or a C40 recharge, and they were naming their electric cars as recharge. But apparently that's putting people off because people are going, oh, that means I've got to recharge it. Well, yeah, the clue's in the name. Uh, so they're dropping that. They're no longer calling them recharge. And I don't agree with all this rubbish about, you like the Porsche Taycan. You can buy a Taycan, which is an electric car, and now you can buy a Taycan Turbo, which is insane because it doesn't have a turbo. You people who work in the marketing departments for electric car companies, get your own names, all right? Don't use ours from the internal combustion engine heritage of the automotive industry. You should not be able to just repurpose the words that we've been using because the words that we've been using are directly related to the thing that's in the engine i.e. this is called a T5 because it's a T for a turbo and it's a 5 for 5 cylinder. So I do not want to be seeing the Volvo something something T5 because it won't have a turbo and it won't have 5 cylinders. Rant over. Anyway, next subheading, Volvos. Jeff, please buy a 960 next. If you saw my video on... Um, so you want to buy a Swedish estate car. I love the Volvo 960. My dad had a Volvo 960 when I was a kid. The only reason I haven't bought one is because not many come up for sale and they're expensive because they only came really, yes, they did some four cylinders, but they were mostly 2.5 and three litre six cylinder automatics, which means you're talking 23 miles to the gallon average. That's why I haven't bought a 960. And someone else just says, Volvo should be compulsory. Yeah, I like that. What, like mandatory? Yeah, come and get your mandatory Volvo. And then um, a few months later, we could be like, oh, your Volvo might not work effectively. You need to come and get another Volvo. And then you've had two Volvos. And then we could have a booster Volvo, couldn't it? And then you'd all have three Volvos. And we'd have lots and lots of Volvos. Everyone would have Volvos. Um, to be fair, if Volvos were mandatory, we'd have much less health problems than from the, the other thing that was mandatory not going into that. Right, let's look at some of the letters that I've been sent because some of these are very good as well. Uh, if you're still watching, then obviously you've got nothing better to do. Uh, let me know what you've been up to on your Sunday. I mean, did you do something more exciting than me, which was basically moan that I was a little bit hungover? Uh, because as I said, whiskey, chicken wings, birthday party, barbecue, sunshine. Now all of that is gone and we have grey sky and I haven't even got my shorts on. Anyway, letter number one. Hi, Jeff. The UK is set to waste more than £16 billion this decade after regulatory and planning failures have left Scotland producing more wind power than can be transmitted down south. The cost, calculated by think tank Carbon Tracker, is expected to find its way into higher electricity bills for cash-strapped households and businesses. The problem arises because, although the UK is a wind superpower, there are not enough cables to take renewable electricity from Scotland where most of it is produced, to England, where most of it is needed. When bottlenecks arise, wind farms are paid to switch off their turbines and gas stations in England are paid extra to supply the necessary electricity. The system, known as curtailment, cost more than £700 million in 2023, with a further £140 million spent in January and February of this year alone. Excellent. So they're producing so they're, they're, they've worked out that we can put wind farms in Scotland and they work really well, even though Scotland pulled down 15 million trees to build wind farms. 
and they're producing so much power that England can't take it and there's a bottleneck and then we have to pay them to shut the wind farms down. Another score for common sense. Letter number two, and you've all seen this one as well. A pedicab has caught fire outside Buckingham Palace. Pedicab. It took me a minute to work out whether that was something to do with paedophiles on bikes, but it's not. It's essentially an electric tuk-tuk. Um, I mean, paedophiles on bikes, Buckingham Palace. You can understand why I went straight to paedophile when I saw Buckingham Palace there, but that is a whole other conspiracy theory. Anyway, the fire is not believed to be suspicious or deliberate, the Met Police said. An electric pedicab, nothing to do with paedophiles, otherwise known as a rickshaw, caught fire outside Buckingham Palace. He added, given the location, a few people were speculating about it being terrorism or some form of protest, but it just looked like a bike on fire to me. And then there's this amazing quote from someone that says, I overheard one copper say it was a rickshaw that had caught fire rather than an e-bike, but the driver was nowhere to be seen. Why did the driver do a runner? Clearly he didn't own the e-bike then, did he? But I'd imagine it was quite expensive because it's got a big lithium battery in it. So who paid for it? And why did the driver run off? Lots of questions. Uh, none to do with paedophiles because those you're not allowed to ask those questions. Anyway, letter number three. Hi, Boat people complaining about the amount of poo in the river. Uh, boat people. That'll be me with my speedboat, won't it? I'll be on my speedboat on the River Thames moaning about the amount of sewage. Sewage treatment work sites not increasing at the same rate as population. Instead, the profits go into the water company's CEO pockets. Boiler gas cannot be allowed to escape into the atmosphere. So it is condensed into mild watery acid and sent down the sewers, which is destroying the treatment plants which is the real reason why condensing boilers are being banned. Population and illegal immigrants increasing who have to poo somewhere and are failing treatment and the failing treatment plants have reached capacity. So the poo has to go somewhere. Now we're told by the government we must have heat pumps installed, which requires holes being dug in the back garden, which is called fracking. So now millions of deep holes are being dug, destabilizing the Earth's surface surface which we are told to do so by the government it's all bollocks quite a complex comment there we go into sewage in the rivers due to the water companies not doing their job to sewage everywhere else due to the runoff from condensed mild watery acid that's also going into the water system and then heat pumps and digging in the garden so a great comment there make of that what you will maybe you can understand it better than i did but i think bits of it made sense letter number three hi jeff been enjoying your youtube videos and appreciate your common sense analysis thank you very much can't spell analysis without anal uh, i've been playing with some figures for another project and i thought you might find this interesting according to government figures the average pay in the uk is currently 675 pounds per week equating to 17 pounds 92 per hour Ditto, there are 24.4 million private households in the UK. Assuming that each household spends 45 minutes putting their clocks and timers forward. Clocks changed today. Uh, hang on, it's really easy to do on this one. I just click that hour button. Done! Ha <laughs> ha! I bet it's not as easy to do in a modern car, is it? I just literally clicked a button. I did that live on telly, which is going to undo the next bit of this argument. But let me know how long it takes you to change the clock in your car. Anyway, so the time that people spend adjusting their phones and computers and clocks, etc., amounts to 18.3 million man hours. Putting the clocks, etc., back in the autumn always takes longer, say 75 minutes per household. 30.5 million man hours together a total of 48.8 million man hours just messing with your clocks in autumn and spring apply the hourly rate as above and we have a total cost to british households of some 875 million pounds and that does not include the clocks in public and commercial premises so we will have spent 875 million pounds worth of time by the end of the year we will be back where we started it's in it's in effect a tax on our time put that in your ev and smoke it best wishes keep posting steve thank you steve i enjoyed that comment um i don't think i spend 45 minutes changing the clocks in my house we've only got the one clock and as i said that one is very very fast to change the clock in my wife's car is so complicated that we will never change it. We'll just wait until autumn when the clock will come back around and be correct again. Uh, as many of you will with your cars as well. So let me know on that one. Uh, letter number four. Jeff, 
For your information, as you know, we run a Volvo V70 D5 P3. Now on 211,000 miles and averaging 48 miles per gallon, but it returns 55 on a long run. The car has no issues. I know they are not your preferred Volvo wagon, but although they do have an e-brake, not a regular handbrake, they can be left in park or in gear without engaging the electric handbrake. So no binding issues, leaving them for weeks on end. Volvo strikes again. Your friend should have bought a Volvo. Uh, lots of comments on the handbrake thing and the fact that I was leaving my car in park. And many of you said that the very small peg that inserts itself in the transmission to stop the car from rolling when it's in park should not be trusted. So today, not going to lie, I've done it again. Uh, right, letter number five. Jeff, sorry for not being on for a while. I've been to Leicester General Infirmary to see a mate of mine who swallowed a few bits of Hoover while he was drunk. I went to see him today, but the consultant said, you didn't need to come and see him today because we're discharging him tomorrow as he's picking up so well. <laughs> Sorry, it's fun Friday. More to come if you fancy a giggle. Uh, thank you very much for sending me jokes. I don't mind you sending me jokes. Do send me jokes. You never know. They may appear in my videos. Or my stand-up set. Uh, I'm doing a half-hour stand-up set next Sunday at the Barnyard Comedy Club in Nuneaton. Uh, tickets are available on the website and I'll put the link below and I haven't yet planned what I'm going to say. So that'll be an interesting one. Right, letter number six. Is this the last one? No, I've got seven. We're nearly there, guys. We're nearly there, guys and girls. Letter number six. Hi, Jeff. Just a fun one. Next time you see Lee, lay on the floor and look under his milk float and then walk around and look through the wheels at the brakes and say, that'll be £400, please, for the service. It would be fun and I think it's also your sense of humour too. It would make a great comedy video. Do you know what? I will do that next time I see Lee. I'll give his car a service in the car park and then send him an invoice. Right. Last one. Letter number seven. Hi, Jeff. A reference for Volvo deleting the diesel engine and you're mentioning about Volvo trucks. I thought you'd be interested in my take as a Volvo HGV customer. Volvo trucks are now a separate entity from Volvo cars. This commercial arm also now own Renault trucks, which were sold to them many years ago when Renault Group were in financial trouble. They've tried and are trying to market electric trucks, but the price point and range deficit is commercially unviable for 99% of the market and is only suited to small city operations where those who have shelled out to try the product have given negative feedback and found them to be not a commercially viable product. Sounds familiar. Volvo trucks have no plans to scrap the diesel and have just released a new model of the truck. I have three with diesel engine options. Knowing you're a Volvo fan, mine is a Volvo FH13 Globetrotter. It's a six-cylinder, 13-litre. So if it's a six-cylinder and 13-litre, each one of those cylinders has huge capacity, doesn't it? If I'm running at full weight, which is 44 tonnes, I average nine miles per gallon, empty around 12 to 13 miles per gallon. With a maximum load and strong headwind, it's dropped down to 6.8 miles per gallon, but that's pretty rare. Uh, it's the second Volvo I've had. The last one did 1.5 million kilometers before I sold it, and I still see it on the road with its new owner. This one has almost 760,000 kilometers on it, and the only major things I've had with this is the air dryer, starter motor, and alternator replacement. Uh, it's a 2017, and it's badged at 460 horsepower. I had it chipped and had it checked just before Christmas and it's pulling 570 horsepower at the moment. A 570 horsepower Volvo. Well, isn't that the dream? And he even offered to take me out in his Volvo and I will be taking him up on it. I think he exports lambs from Wales. Why are we exporting lambs? Why don't we just eat them here? Why is it when you go to the supermarket, you get New Zealand lamb and not Welsh lamb. It's ridiculous, isn't it? And if it's down to money, then we need to work out what we're doing wrong because we could be totally self-sufficient on food and we could be totally self-sufficient on fuel as a nation and we could be sticking two fingers up to the rest of the world going, ha ha, we got all the fuel we need, we got all the food we need, we're all right, we don't need you. But instead, we're deconstructing all of our industry to make sure that we are fully reliant on other countries to make sure that we cannot stand on our own two feet. And at the same time, we are deleting national pride and all the pride in what you may have to be British or indeed be Welsh or Scottish or Cornish or whatever. We're deleting all of that and replacing it with making sure that we always put light displays on in the capital for Ramadan and every other 
international event for every other religion except the religion that we started with in this country which was well it's probably paganism before we got christianity but essentially we're a christian com country and i'm bringing it back around to easter and i noticed that the labor party tweeted today an easter message in the morning and then they tweeted about trans awareness day so don't be voting labor uh because if you vote labor you'll get an even worse version of what we've got at the moment didn't mean to end on a political note, but we are bang on 30 minutes. Let me know if you made it to the end of the video. Uh, the code word for if you made it to the end of the video is Happy Easter. All right. Happy Easter, everybody. All right. That's what I mean, though. Not just Happy Easter. You've got to go Happy Easter. All right. Happy Easter, everybody. Because otherwise I'll just think that you're writing Happy Easter because you just clicked on the video and you've gone Happy Easter, Jeff. Uh, or you could just write, Jeff, I did make it to the end of the video. To be honest, I thought it was a little bit long. Uh, some funny bits, but you look a bit hungover. Go and have something to eat. Have a great Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Lots of love from whatever your name is. How was that? Was that all right? I reckon we'll roll with that. We're going to go with that. Right, now I'm going to get the car ready for our road trip because tomorrow we're going to see John Hamer.